NSW. Forensic scientists of Reddit. What is the most WTF case that you ever had? A friend of mine is a CSI. And I don't know if he's posted here. But just in case he hasn't. I'll put this here. Anchorage Alaska. 2008. A 27 year old woman hasn't paid her rent in 4 months. The landlord gave her a bit of a reprieve because he knew she was very poor and she was in low income housing. But after 4 months of zero contact. Enough is enough and he calls the cops to get into her place and either see her to talk or change the locks and remove her stuff to a storage shed so the apartment can be released to someone else. The cops find the front door to be bolted and use the landlord's key to get in, then find the woman dead in her shower. Just sort of slumped as if she fell against the wall and slid down. The water wasn't on, and as this is AK in the winter, the water is never shut off by the city because if hot water isn't moving through the pipes they freeze and burst. The fact that her shower is off means she never turned it on, or someone turned it off. The body is taken to the morgue and autopsied at the family's request because no obvious means of death can be found. As far as the examination could conclude, she died from an adrenal surge causing her heart to stop. More commonly known as frightened to death, which yes, can actually happen in some rare cases. The body was old, but no test showed any residual drugs in her system. None were found in the apartment, nor was any sign of anyone having entered or left before the cops. The young pretty average health woman appears to have gotten into her shower, and then her heart stopped due to terror. As far as I know, that's where the story ends. No substantial leads. A friend of mine is a forensic scientist and her department dealt with burglary cases only, usually generating pretty uninteresting stuff to tell people. But her only good story is that once she got a pair of gloves found at the crime scene, she went to examine them and felt that there was something hard inside. She turned the gloves up to get it out, and out falls a thumb, ripped off at the first joint. Apparently this particular burglar was holding up a safe while his mate went underneath it, dropped the safe on his hands, ripped his hands out and ran. They obviously caught the guy. You. Note to self, never lift heavy things ever again. Prof showed a case where a guy committed suicide by holding two forks on a table then proceeded to head bang towards it, stuck both his eyes in. Not a forensic scientist, surprise, but my mom knew a lady whose son committed suicide pretty brutally. While the parents were out, he got a shotgun from the gun cabinet, went to his room, and set it up with string and pulleys on a chair so that it would go off when the bedroom door was opened. He sat in the chair for what may have been hours. Parents get home, mom goes to check on son, bang. That poor woman needed some serious counseling. I can't imagine the guilt. And it was pretty crappy of the kid to make one of his parents unwittingly do the dirty work for him. That's the most brutal thing I have read here, man. The guilt of the mother. This is some really fricked up crap. Yo, comma. Father-in-law is a cop. Years ago, he got called to a scene of a suicide by hanging. The body had been there for a while. Apparently the deceased had managed to do quite a bit of damage to his neck vertebrae, because his spine had snapped and his neck stretched down several feet from the noose. The cops at the scene took pictures of giraffe neck and passed them around the department. Somehow, my wife saw the pictures when she was at the tender age of 12, which screwed her up good enough to be a suitable mate for a guy like me. Always good to hear a happy ending. A friend is a psychologist whose previous life was in crime scene photography. She went to the scene of a suicide in a garage. This guy had a project car that he had worked on his whole life. When he decided to end it all he wanted to go with the car. So he shut the garage and turned on the engine and waited. To top it off, he had taken a bunch of pain and sleeping pills. When my friend got there it was a good while after his death. EMTs and other specialists were there looking for details and whatnot. He was the VP of a fairly large chain of local businesses, so there was an insurance settlement to consider. My friend is in the middle of photographing the scene and the guy was laying there, pronounced dead hours ago and he suddenly just shook hard. She thought it was a death rattle so she kept taking pictures. Eventually the guy sat up and nodded and the EMTs were called back in to stabilize him and eventually save him. Apparently the car had run out of gas right at the moment he went out and he was pronounced dead on the scene. He couldn't talk or do much, but he had actually survived. He couldn't talk or do much, but he had actually survived. 
One of the reasons I never offed myself when I was tempted. I wasn't sure I'd do it right and I was way, way more afraid of failing than succeeding. Forensic chemist here, who occasionally gets called out to crime scenes just to consult on evidence collection. On the first one I ever went on, a father had shot his adult son and put the body in a deep freeze that was in his bedroom. There were a ton of cops and other people from our lab there, but when the coroner asked for help removing the body from the freezer, I volunteered quickly, as I had never been that close to a dead body other than funerals, and was curious, as I helped the coroner lift the body out of the freezer, which still had a bunch of food in it too. A pack of frozen biscuits was stuck to his body. I had to pry them off of him, which was both very weird and kind of funny at the same time. I wonder if the family was still eating food out of the freezing with the dead body in it. EMT here. We had a guy who was naked, bloodied, and tortured. Then left outside in minus 10 degree weather until he froze. We found him literally frozen maybe a day after the fact. Now, my question is... How the heck do you move a 230 pound popsicle without breaking it? Put a glass over him and slide a large piece of paper underneath. I interned at the office of the chief medical examiner when I was 18. Saw a lot of interesting stuff. Learned a lot of interesting things. One case stuck with me more than the rest. I arrived one morning, went down to the basement where bodies were laid out for rounds every morning. On tables lay the usual, a couple folks who died in a hospital and needed a partial autopsy to sign off on a death certificate, a drug overdose, a drug murder. Then, on one table, there was a blue Tupperware bin, a big one, about 3x 3x 2 feet. It was filled with concrete, and out of the edges a little plastic wrap was lining between the concrete and the bin. And then out of the top of the concrete a couple toes were poking out. The story was out in the county a family saw a small fire in the woods outside of their house. Called the fire department. And after putting out the flames, they found this bin. When we cracked the bin open we found half of a man. About from the belly button down. Someone had thought the best way to dispose of this body would be to cut it in half. Wrap it in plastic. Put it in a Tupperware bin. Fill the bin with concrete, and set it on fire. What they had really done was essentially cook the body in an oven, with the plastic wrap acting as a roasting bag. Skin was sloughing off of the legs and feet, and the skin was discolored by this time. A nice green. Though this was about 10 years ago I distinctly remember still being able to make our saw marks on the top edge of this half however. Notes were taken, and no signs of death were found on the legs, and no indications of the person's identity either. Unfortunately my internship ended a few weeks before they found the top half, so I never got to learn more about the case, but the image still certainly sticks with me till now. You were twice the man he was. Not a forensic scientist, but a true story is good all the same. Officer I used to know was telling me of this kid's suicide. The parents had left for the day and the kid decided enough is enough. He grabbed his dad's shotgun and sat down on the sofa, with the shotgun in his mouth. He pulled the trigger. Blood, brain, and teeth covered the entire room and ceiling. The blast created a huge hole in the back of his head. Since the gun was in his mouth, he just sort of slid down the barrel. The parents come home and walk in to see their son sitting on the couch, shotgun in his mouth with the barrel protruding out of the back of his skull. X Digital Forensics Drug dealers love taking photos of their girlfriends in their underwear. They also love taking photos of their stash. The geniuses hardly ever turn off location services. So each photo is GA tagged. Man. 40 Y. O. Kills wife and children with army rifle. Old model. Car. 3000 joules muzzle energy. Puts the muzzle under the chin and fires. The bullet takes half the face away. Blood drops led to bathroom. In front of the mirror. Then to the ammo box. And finally to the place of the second and last shot to the head. And a case of someone found dead from a gunshot wound to the heart. On a bridge. Without any weapon. Bullet or cartridge case. Circumstantial evidence finally indicated a suicide. But we still don't know how he got the weapon to float away. The bottom of the river was searched. And nothing was found except the tools of the bridge builders. Anyone who suggests a way to make the weapon disappear in the second story. Be assured that a lot of possibilities were imagined and discussed during the inquiry. The problem is, and this is where reality separates from fiction. We must bring facts to the table. 
supported by the traces and evidence. So, someone taking the gun, a dozen of helium filled balloons or a wooden floater tied to the gun are all possibilities, but as long as we don't have evidence backing them, they are pure speculation, as good as any other. Worked at Amis for a bit, had a couple pass away from a two person plane crash. When the autopsy began it smelled a bit like burnt barbecue and the people in the body bags weren't in your typical dead lying flat position. They were kind of stuck in a fetal position-ish. Open up the bag and I saw weird bumps on each of their heads. Ask the ME what was up with the bumps. I guess at high temps the brain expands and needs somewhere to go. At some point it just kinda pops out of the skull. So their brains were some inside some outside of skull. Then we try examining the body, and it looks like a cheap prop from a movie. I notice a wedding band on the female passenger and try my best to remove it. The whole finger comes off with it. Felt kinda bad. Then I spend 10 minutes trying to clean off what I can only imagine was human grease and burnt flesh off the ring so we could package it up and eventually return it to the family. Plane crashes are pretty crazy. I regularly post on unsolved mysteries so I thought his was fitting here. One of the best cases on forensic files was cold case that had gone unsolved for decades. A man told police he had picked up a hitchhiker in the evening. After the man and the hitchhiker got into a fight, the man threw him out of his car two miles away from his mother's house on a busy highway. The man later came home to his mother's house only to find the hitchhiker at his mother's house. He left to go call police from a payphone. This was before cell phones. The police found his mother dead in bed. The man was a beneficiary of a huge life insurance policy and was the prime suspect. The cops or anyone did not believe the man's story. It was inconceivable that the hitchhiker, who did not know where the mother's house was, could make a two mile journey with turns in a neighborhood to just randomly break in and kill the man's mother, who he didn't know. But there was blood at the scene and a palm print on the staircase that was not the man's nor the mother's. After some investigation people at Hardy's did confirm that there was a man that fit the description looking to hitchhike. Still they just assumed the man had paid the other man to kill his mother. 15 years later after the invention of CODIS, the DNA was matched to a career criminal who definitely matched the description of the hitchhiker. After bringing him in and interrogating him. The killer had no idea he had killed the mother of the man who gave him a ride. He simply walked through this neighborhood looking for a house that looked empty and his mother's was the only one without the lights on. It's baffling. <laughs> Made an account and quit lurking just for this thread. Crime scene tech here. This one stands out as I was still training at the time. Suicide by gunshot. Guy went to an indoor range and rented a monster of a revolver. A judge if if I recall correctly, this thing could shoot 410 shot shells. The force basically blew the top of his head off. What remained of the skin from the top of his head was flapped into the skull cavity and his eyes looked like they were bulging out. Blood and brains up to 10 featuring away. Found his safety goggles about 10 yards down range. The scariest part was he was watching others shoot beforehand. Sometimes I wonder if he planned to take others with him. It was a long time ago. Retired now. My ME unit investigated overflow cases. Basically cases that the main unit wouldn't need to waste resources on. Came down to us. We would get things like accidents and suicides. Open and shut. Sometimes we got more. Intense cases. The one that stuck. It was the first time they actually warned me before opening the body bag. The death was reported as an accident. He fell from the balcony of his apartment on the 12th floor, into the, the tree beside the building, hitting every branch on the way down. Turn out his mother pushed him. The result was a grotesque mess. I was at a regional medical center in rural Guatemala when we had a case come in from an OTA, road traffic accident, involving a pedestrian and a chicken bus. For those of you who don't know a popular but incredibly dangerous, form of public transport are retired American school buses that have been painted all sorts of vibrant colors but underneath the mechanics are shot to crap. Anyway this pedestrian had been hit by one of these rolling death traps which was fully loaded going around 80 miles per hour and ended up getting wrapped under the front right wheel arch and completely mangled beyond recognition. They found bits of this guy spread 2 kilometers down the road as the initial impact had split his torso down the middle and basically turned him inside out. When all the bits had been collected the height of the body bag was around 2 inches so you imagine the state of the remains. 
Passers-by helped us pick up bits from the side of the road but dogs and cats ran off with a fair amount of the smaller bits. Guatemala is a cool place. Not a forensic scientist, but I majored in anthropology with a focus on forensic anthropology. Given that, I was a fairly regular reader of the forensic science quarterly. Here are a couple that I remember. Kid found on top of an elevator in a six-story dorm. Apparently he was elevator surfing which is just as dumb as it sounds. He somehow got his head caught in the cables and got it twisted around a couple of times. This did not immediately kill him. He died from asphyxiation. This means he had anywhere from 30 seconds to a couple of minutes to contemplate what had happened to him before he lost consciousness. Another one was sort of a mystery case. Headless corpse found in a truck in a national park. No head was to be found in the immediate area. Truck was turned on but had run out of gas. The wound was very clean. No sawing. Almost like a guillotine cut. The investigating authorities were rather confused, but eventually they found a receipt in his pocket for 50 yards of nylon rope. They widened the investigation and eventually found the rope tied to a tree with a noose at one end. Further searching of this area eventually turned up the head. Pretty unique method of suicide. Mystery solved. This one isn't from the magazine, but a story personally related to me from the officer involved. A call comes in for a 50-ish black woman dead in a garage. Investigation reveals it is actually a 35-year-old white male. Dude put on a dress, rigged a noose to his garage door opener and proceeded to watch some pee in his garage while choking himself with a garage door opener. Battery in the remote died. And then so did he. Another case that sticks in my memory is of a guy that decided to kill himself with a .3006 and a .308. For you non-gun people, those are two very powerful calibers. Literally overkill. Anyway, this guy manages to get two rifles under his chin and fire them at the same time while lying on his bed. This obliterates his head. I mean like there was nothing left but a stump. That isn't why the case sticks with me. However, what happened next is that the local forensic department decides to reconstruct the head as an exercise. They collect every piece, except for the orbital sockets, which evaporated, and put them all back together. The result came out looking very much like the victim, although slightly bug-eyed. The before and after of that is something I don't think I'll ever forget. A neighboring state had a case like the one with the nylon rope, on a 1st of April. The CSI didn't believe it at first, when he received the call from dispatch for a headless body in a car that was still running. Not a crime scene guy, used to be a first responder, guy was sitting at a table, slumped over, with every single knife from a very nice knife set sticking out of his back, arranged just the way they were in the knife block, wife was standing there, still yelling at him for dying too soon. He had it coming, he had it coming, he only had himself to blame. If you'd have been there, if you'd ever seen it, I betcha you would have done the same. Retired undertaker here. Duck hunter in gear found dead on front porch. Looked like shotgun went off and hit him, close range in the chest. Got him back to funeral home for autopsy. Small town. He had been stabbed about 30 times. A dog was reportedly spotted laughing near the crime scene. A lot of times family would rather you declare it a suicide instead of death by autoerotic asphyxiation. I would like to add that I am not a forensic scientist. I just interned for a crime lab and always thought it was fricked up. Yep. Dude from my high school committed suicide and the school even has a day set aside to wear orange to honor the kid's death. But it turns out he wasn't suicidal. Just trying to get off while using a belt and couldn't get the belt off either. His parents found him in his room naked with a belt 45 minutes later. Self-inflicted GSW. Pistol in each hand. One entrance wound, one exit wound. Two spent shell casings. Neighbors report two shots fired. No bullet holes in ceiling. Walls. Furniture. Windows. Nothing. Sat at the scene for an hour with Emmy and two officers searching everything. But the bullets never turned up. Still scratching my head. Okay Reddit detectives. Calm yourselves. It was a definite textbook suicide W motive and signed suicide note. One gun in each hand, each fired by the deceased. No nearby windows, no open doors, no wounded victims running away into the night. Nothing was moved, there wasn't a murder. It's strange that the search turned up no bullet holes, 
but there are details about the deceased that would solve it for you guys that I'm not going to post online for the sake of his anonymity. Jesus guys. No open windows. There is a very large difference between an entrance and an exit wound, and he was definitely not moved. Not me but my professor. This young kid, teens-ish, was playing with a loaded gun and accidentally shot himself in the face. He then tried to write help me on the wall with his blood. So sad. We saw the scene photos for class. All the details of the case were never discussed, including where it happened, name, or circumstances surrounding it. A lot of cases my prof didn't even know the final outcome so we heard a lot of interesting cases but never knew where they went. I ended up in an FS lab so no CS for me. I had a professor who was an expert in osteology and would train radiologists and doctors to recognize defensive fractures in arm bones. Defending yourself from an attack can leave a very distinctive spiral fracture on your forearms, and in his years of research, he'd never encountered that specific fracture pattern anywhere except in a defensive wound. Until he was attending a seminar at the University of Toronto in February, and when leaving the lecture, he was walking down an outdoor flight of stairs when someone called out to him to ask a question. He had his hands in his pockets because he wasn't wearing gloves, turned, slipped and fell while perpendicular to the steps. His forearm hit the step and resulted in the exact spiral fracture he'd never seen anywhere else. And best part is that the radiologist that examined him was someone he himself had trained to look for this sort of fracture as a warning sign for domestic violence. Digital Forensics Case Executive was using way more data than anyone else on his aircraft. The local IT guys took it to check it out for viruses and whatnot. Found lots of child pee. Guy got brought up on charges. Lost his job. Family torn apart. The whole spiel. We do our analysis. Find out there was a virus they were serving said pictures for a dark website. Only thing that got him off was the rate at which the data was accessed. He got fat restitution but that won't put his life back together. Made me get out of the business because I though this guy was guilty for sure but we kept finding little hints that suggested it was something other than what we thought. Had we missed something, he would be in jail as we speak. Couldn't sleep with that kind of burden. After things like this I think it should be required that the whole public be notified that the person is innocent. Like, if they were to do a bit on the news, to legally notify the business of their innocence. I'm a specialty forensics investigator that focuses on fire and explosions. Somehow, a lady with a coffee can of gas, her husband's asphalt covered work clothes, and a front load dryer, managed to turn the dryer into a rocket ship that launched through a plate glass window and 10 featuring into the road. We have no known models that can demonstrate how the available materials were able to launch the dryer. Attended a lecture by a pathologist once who asked us what household item someone had managed to kill themselves with. A toothbrush, a rubber band or a matchstick? He went on to tell us that a man had killed himself accidentally while trying to clean his ear out with a matchstick. Punctured a blood vessel, painted a wall with his own blood, passed out and bled out on the sofa. A friend's wife does forensics field work for a sparsely populated area and had said that only one case has been noteworthy. She was asked to analyze a crime scene in a house used to manufacture M. She surveyed the outside and then proceeded with an officer to the kitchen where the basement door was located. In the basement they found a metal door bolted shut and they decided to call for bolt cutters to enter. They didn't have them at the time so she kept examining the area and found a side door to THR room behind a furnace. The lock was jimmed open and they found a sawn off 12 gar shotgun had been pointed at the bolted door. The gun was loaded and the trip wire still attached to the shotgun. She described it as the most chilling experience of her career. I worked in a morgue for a while. Lots of weird things. One case in particular stands out. A man was found dead in a food truck. He looked pretty normal from the outside. After we took off his clothes things started looking a bit odd. He was wearing women's underwear that had holes cut in them for his dong. He probably had on around 20 pairs of the underwear. He also had a dong pump on his dong with a few condoms on. I don't remember what the cause of death was. Wonder what his family thought about it. Maybe not the most gruesome, but definitely one of the weirder things I saw. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video.
Bye for now.